Welcome and thank you for attending the Sherburn Killington Historical Presentation of the History of Pico. It's like old home week in here. It's marvelous. So great. I'm sorry you're not more comfortable. I'm sorry it's so hot. I'm sorry there were so many stairs. What can you do? I'd like to give a shout out to Rich McCoy, to the Killington Resort, and Pico Mountain. <laughs> For providing this fantastic old space, as well as the town of Killington, who did advertising for us and supports the Sherburn Killington historians. I want to thank Chris Carr Productions for the beautiful posters that you've seen everywhere. His staff put those together and um, for free, <laughs> and they're, they're marvelous. The historian's mission is to share the information, the pictures, all of the research that we do with all of you. That's the whole reason for the historians. And we're always looking for more people. So if this kind of thing interests you, please come on board. You know, we have someone who's going to do a train piece in December. It, you don't need a skill set. You just need to be interested. So we have two hours, actually, not even anymore, <laughs> two hours to get through this. So therefore, please save your comments and questions for the open discussion at the end of the program. We hope you enjoyed the slideshow, which will be followed by a video promotional from the 70s from Bob Perry, many of you will remember him, and, uh, and, uh, and our distinguished panel. We invite you to go to the bar, but we also ask that you uh, do so maintaining respect for speakers. It's a pleasure to see you all here, and thank you. I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, Tom Aker. Tom Aker. Classic Pico event. Free. <laughs> the year of 1937, just looked it up. In January, Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in for his second term. The Great Depression entered its ninth year. In May, the passenger airship Hindenburg caught fire in New Jersey while attempting to dock. In July, 39-year-old Amelia Earhart launched her final flight from Miami on an attempt to circumnavigate the globe. And both the Golden Gate Bridge and the Lincoln Tunnel opened for business. But Thanksgiving Day 1937 here in ski country was much more monumental than that. Pico Peak opened for business with a 1,200-foot rope tow powered by a Hudson automobile engine. We're here to celebrate that today. Um, I have a few um, disclaimers. This presentation is really a 20th century presentation. <laughs> we don't have a lot of content um, from the 21st century. So when you try to put together a program with 85 years of history, you got to cut some corners. So we cut out the corporate guys. I want to thank the, uh, the, the Sherburn Killington Historical Society for all the work they put in putting this program together, um, particularly Sheila Pillsmaker and Anne Kind Thomas, who is running, uh, she's the one who put together the slideshow. So thank you to you, and thanks for inviting me. My name is Thomas Aker. I'm a PICO loyalist. I am your narrator and moderator today. I have three promises for you. One, this will be fun. Two, we will miss some details. And three, we'll probably get some details wrong. So if you know the answer to something, you can tell us later. Um, but the beautiful thing about uh, history is that 
you, you, we, can, we can rewrite it a little bit, right, Carl? Isn't that what you told me? We can rewrite the history a little bit. All right. I want to introduce our panelists, our distinguished panelists. Uh, they'll all be speaking um, at some point in the program here, but they can't speak over you. So if you give us the courtesy, they put a lot of time into this, and uh, we really appreciate your attention. Our first panelist will be Justin Lindholm. He was born in Rutland in 1954. By the time he was four, he had skied at Pico, Mad River, Sugarbush, and Bromley. He, he left Vermont for a period of time to go to school, and then he returned at the ripe age of 22 to participate in the sp family business known as Lindholm's Sports, corner of Terrell Street and Main Street in Rutland. He has an intimate knowledge of the evolution of gear and the skiing experience as it evolved over time. He outfitted many a Pico Ski Club athlete. He also has a unique perspective in that his family lived in the North Tower in Menden, which was built by Brad and Janet Mead. Our second panelist, David Wright, is the president of the Middletown Historical Society. He's a retired home builder. He was born in 1944, much of his childhood being in Menden, living just above the beaver pond uh, down the road. His uncle Grover Wright was a key partner in both Brad and Janet Mead and Carl and June Acker's uh, ownership and operation of Pico. He was the manager of the Long Trail Lodge for 40 years, between 1930 and 1970. So David brings a very unique perspective to uh, growing up here with his parents working for their Uncle Grover and how much effort went into the hospitality, hospitality side of skiing here at Pico. Our third panelist is none other than the legendary Carl Acker himself. <laughs> Carl was born in 1949. He was only three when Andrea Mead Lawrence won her medals, but he grew up right here at Pico, all four seasons, all the time. When he was just nine, his father passed away in 1958. But he was already a competitive skier, and he was surely influenced by his father's teaching his father's commitment to his family and to this place. Uh, his mother, June, continued to operate the ski area until 1964 when they sold it to the Belvins. He's continued to be involved with skiing throughout his life, coaching here and elsewhere. Um, he's always available for a ski tour and a historical, uh, he'll give you several long stories, but luckily the lift rides are only about eight minutes long. <laughs> Our fourth and final panelist is none other than Frank Heald. Frank grew up in Cavendish, Vermont. He was born in 1941, attended Castleton College, graduated in 1963, and he married a very competitive skier, Bonnie Coopley. In the early 60s, Bonnie and Frank were recruited by the Pico Ski Club to participate in teaching kids how to ski, and Bonnie to help coach their, the, the racing athletes. And then uh, in 1971, he famously was approached at a camping trip by Bruce Belden to join the Pico leadership team. He signed on in his tenure here over the 25 years between 1971 and 1995, spans most of the Belden era. And during that time, uh, most of what you see here at the resort operating today was developed, built, and established. Uh, so those are our panelists. Our format today is I'm going to narrate a slideshow that was put together by Ann it covers the tips of the waves. We know there's some pictures that are out of order, but it covers uh, the topics that we want to address with you. After that, we're gonna watch a short film that was produced by Bob Perry in the 1970s. And then each speaker will have an opportunity to present uh, a short piece for you. And then we'll go into Q&A. And the Q&A will come from both you and from me. I also have several quiz questions for the audience that I may ask along the way. I'll ask the first one right now. Who knows what Walt, Walt Disney's first feature film animation was that was published in September of 1937? Negative. Ooh, it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. All right, so with that, 
we're going to we're going to switch gears and we're going to narrate the slideshow that Ann put together and it is an awesome catalog of pictures uh, and I guess I'm advancing the slides myself. Great. All right. So, like like most stories that surround Rutland County, there's a proctor involved. Mortimer Proctor uh, and his family owned all of the land around Pico. He actually was given this land uh, for a birthday present when he was 21. Um, I, I got uh, the keys to an old lawnmower. <laughs> there, uh, there was a lot of activity here at Pico before there was skiing. Um, the uh, Pico camp was developed at a sports, sportsman's type camp uh, up on Pico Pond. It's hard to find now because it's not on any, any maps. It still exists. Uh, there was a lot of logging. Uh, there was uh, lo logging and forestry, mostly by the Proctor family. And uh, we didn't research whether or not that was to support building the homes for all of the employees down in Rutland and Proctor, but uh, they were very involved with expanding housing so they could have more quality housing for their employees. This is Pico Camp uh, picture taken less than 10 years ago. Uh, so it still exists. It's still a spectacular um, uh, remote uh, facility. Another shot of it. All right, so lots of hikers. The, uh, the Green Mountain Club actually was active in the community here as far back as 1923. David will tell some more stories about how the Green Mountain Club uh, used uh, the, uh, the, the, the area and particularly the Long Trail. And then, then in 1938, the Long Trail Lodge was actually um, uh, constructed by the Green Mountain Club with the permission and support of Mortimer Proctor. That's important because not long after uh, the uh, Long Trail Lodge was established, it was really established as a, as a summertime type facility, uh, skiing started here and they had to convert it to winter. Uh, there were, of course, uh, fire towers um, on Pico Mountain to uh, keep track of. Uh, there were fire towers up and down the Green Mountains, and uh, this is a picture from as far back as uh, the 1920s. All right, this is the Long Trail Lodge. The Long Trail Lodge, for those of you who are who, who are whose memory are more recent, it was actually on this side of Route Four, and it was more like a campus than a lodge. Um, it wasn't until later that they built the inn at Long Trail across the road. These are some shots of the uh, Long Trail Lodge. The Long Trail actually went right through the building. You had to walk in a door, go through the building, walk out another door in order to stay on the trail. Uh, if you walk up around the parking area at the inn at Long Trail, on the Pico side, you will still see uh, uh, um, foundations in the uh, in the forest there so uh, I think we I don't know where we got these pictures but they're all uh, from someone's catalog of activities back in the 30s of the Long Trail Lodge this is Carl Acker's prom date from um, <laughs> 1950 I forgot the year Carl all right so uh, wintertime needs the hospitality side of skiing people needed a place to stay if they're gonna come here so um, Mortimer Proctor, of course, commissioned and, and allowed the development and construction of the, uh, the chalet, this is called the chalet long trail, or the, what was it called? Winter Annex, thank you. I told you we'd get some stuff wrong. Uh, all right, great color picture of the, what is now the Inn at Long Trail on the Deer Leap side of the road. Uh, this is a nice shot looking out to what you can see as the top of a slope cleared. So they were skiing Pico by the time of this picture. Uh, you can also see at the dome in the 60s, you'll learn that we were, they were calling the top of Pico the dome. You can see the Sunset Shush, which was built in 1938 by Charlie Proctor, who was a relative, a Dartmouth skier, a very competitive uh, athlete. He uh, hand cut the Sunset Shush in 1938. So you can see that they're skiing Sunset Shush and they're skiing A-slope by the time of this picture. 
the rest of the campus across the street is the old uh, Green Mountain Club Long Trail Lodge. Uh, and this is a shot that uh, shows the type of equipment and the happy faces of uh, Pico skiers who were coming to stay at the Long Trail Lodge. All right, the next section is clearly the, uh, the most significant in terms of origination of skiing. And in 1930s, there were several other ski areas that were kicking off. Uh, Brad and Janet Mead had skied in Switzerland. Um, they moved to Vermont and built the um, North Tower between 1932 and 1937. Uh, in 1932, Brad was 27 years old. He'd already been to Switzerland. He had already convinced Mortimer Proctor to sign a lease so that he could operate a ski area, and he had enough capital behind him to open a small ski area. I won't tell you what I was doing when I was 27, but I wasn't that accomplished. <laughs> so opening season 1938 was just the 30, the 1,200 foot rope toe over on Little Pico that would be closer to uh, where the LP t uh, where the Little Pico triple uh, T bar. Uh, was to the left of LPT. Uh, this is a sh couple of shots of the North Tower, which is down in Menden. Um, if you follow the the uh, the course, uh, one of the roads that goes through the what is now the Menden Mountain Orchard, you would come to this site. This is uh, we believe this is a shot of Brad and Janet while they were in Davos, Switzerland, before they moved back to Vermont. Young Andrea, born and raised in Rutland, uh, she lived at the North Tower, and this is a shot of her, age five, skiing down near the North Tower. This is uh, in Menden. This is the first opening year trail map for Pico Ski Area. Uh, actually, this has got to be 1940 because it's got the. It's got to be 1941 because it's got the chairlift, uh, the uh, T-bar. But it is uh, an early example of what they used for marketing to get folks to come to Vermont to ski. But it's definitely out of place. <clears throat> All right. Um, I actually remember this building. This was the original warming hut for Pico, which is uh, beyond what we now know as the base of LPT. It was up on a knoll. So most of the developed skiing was over to the east of what we now call LPT. Janet Mead standing somewhere facing down uh, on a beautiful snow day. Janet Mead and Stevia Corzum. This name is going to be more important. Stevia uh, later became a chaffee and she raised three competitive alpine ski racers, two of whom skied in the Olympics, one of whom became Susie Chapstick. So that's Janet Mead skiing with Susie Chapstick's mom. All right, good shot of the Sunset Shush and the developed part of Little Pico at the time. Uh, A slope, B slope, C slope, and then the Sunset Shush to the top. Uh, another aerial photo, and I don't know where we got these, but they're, pretty, they're, they're really kind of cool because they show the parking area for skiing at Pico was actually across Route 4. You had to carry your, your skis in to get to the, to the warming hut. And then the, the occupied ski area is really right around down um, near where the sports center is. And if you think skiing's expensive now, <laughs> the discount was substantial. I think it, it must have been 50 cents for, this, for the day. It's discounted to 25. Yeah, we'll print, print the discounts out. All right. Um, this is an important marker uh, because it, this was installed on the Little Pico Triple Chair uh, after it was installed in 1980. Uh, the the uh, Roebling Constam T bar was installed and opened in spring of 19 or the winter January of 1941, um, and this marker was was put to commemorate its decommission and the opening of the LPT. Now it's interesting to note that that Constam Roebling T-bar, Roebling is the same family that built the Brooklyn Bridge in the 1880s. Now the Roebling that built the Brooklyn Bridge, the actual en that engineer, he died while the bridge was being constructed. So this is his his uh, his uh, probably his grandsons or his nephews that are now running a cable company, 
And if you think of, uh, of an aerial tramway of any kind, it's really a, a conveyor that is based on the, the principles of a cable. So that's why Roebling was an important co partner for Constamp. The other interesting thing about this slide is that that, um, that T-bar was only 39 years old. How old is LPT? It's got to be 41 right now, 43. So the T-bar only lasted 39 years. LPT has lasted longer. 1941, the opening of the Constam Roebling, uh, uh, we, we call it the Constam T-Bar, was a big deal. The community was behind it. This is an ad from the Rutland Herald. S many of you will remember some of these businesses, um, but there certainly was an outpouring of support to have a destination ski area here in central Vermont, and, um, and lots of businesses were supporting it. Uh, Bob Stafford was here. The, he was the governor. Was he the governor at the time? Somebody correct me. Senator. He was a senator at the time in 1941. No, but in 1941 he was the governor. We'll call him a local politician. That's safe. <laughs> so, uh, so he was here to help open the T-Bar in 1941. And there are lots of pictures from around that winter. They had a lot of good snow. Um, this Pico Peak logo started to show up in around the nineteen uh, mid nineteen forties. It was actually designed by Brad Mead himself. He was more than uh, just a, uh, a an entrepreneur and a scary operator. He was an artist and an architect, and had training in both of those fields. And uh, he designed this logo. It is still the logo that the Pico Ski Foundation uses uh, for our activities and events. So the cars give this one away. Nineteen forty four. Um, so this three years into it, uh, I don't know if it snowed more then, but that certainly looks like a great snow day. I also like uh, how wide open the trails were. We've used this particular picture and, one, and some like it to try and recreate some of the training facilities at Little Pico over the years. Uh, great shot going up the T-bar. This is in, a, in approximately early 1940s before they painted the, the barn of the T-Bar brown and you lost the, the sign because at some point in the later 40s and early 50s you stopped seeing the sign. It also has wooden towers. So not long from now, a few more pictures in, you'll see that the towers were replaced with steel. This picture we're pretty confident is Carl Acker's father. That chin is a dead giveaway. We cannot tell you who he's riding with. Um, but uh, we also estimate that may have been at the very top of the T-bar, which many of you remember, that was a treacherous experience. Uh, speaking of the top of the T-bar, um, wooden lift towers, uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, the unload platform that many of us remember. Some of us still go to therapy <laughs> to recover from it. Um, but it, it was fun, um, no doubt. It was part of the adventure. And a lot of uh, my friends that we grew up with, we felt like we learned as much about skiing going up the hill as we did going down, just to make sure we maneuvered some of the tourists that didn't make it up the T-bar. <laughs> this may be one of the last pictures of Brad and Janet Mead together riding the T-bar. So in September of 1942, Brad Mead dies as a young man, 37 years old, um, leaving his wife, uh, widow, owning a ski area and having to decide what to do. It also, as you may recall, 1942 was kind of a big year for um, the rest of the world as uh, Pearl Harbor uh, was December 7th of that year. So um, Janet Mead had some decisions to make, um, and uh, she uh, kept the ski area open. Oh, before we get to that, uh, we got to talk about the um, Sunset 71. After Brad died at a, on a boating accident on uh, the Chittenden Reservoir, and they decided they were going to bury him on Pico, they walked up the Sunset Shush until they got to a spot where Janet could see the reservoir. And that's why they picked the spot where they did. And many of you have skied in there and s saw that both Brad and Janet Mead are buried just off the trail. And that's how Janet picked the spot. So Janet Mead had some, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Forgot the ski patrol and ski school. So 
in the early days of skiing, there were two things, two needs. Uh, people who wanted to learn how to ski needed somebody to teach them. Uh, and then, of course, people who got hurt while skiing needed someone to care for them. So these two um, career paths really opened up in the, in the 1930s just as the sport was opening up in and of itself. So the Volunteer Ski Patrol, the Otter Ski Patrol, was created by Pico Skiers and remains the oldest registered ski patrol in the nation. Um, in 1938, the second year of operation, Brad and Janet recruited Carl Acker as a very young uh, ski instructor to come in from Switzerland so that they could have a marquee ski school because they knew people were going to want to know and learn how to ski. So these uh, few pictures that we've got for you are from uh, the, the uh, early 40s of the Otter Ski Patrol. If you uh, want to know what we're looking at, the, the building on the left is the Otter Ski Patrol building and it was located approximately where the Pico Ski Club is now, um, facing off towards uh, what would be LPT, uh, but at that time was a, a rope tow and then later the Constam T-Bar. So, I don't know if Joel LaFrancis can tell us, I don't think he was there, but how many ski patrollers does it take to keep this thing from running down the hill? It looks like it weighs about 600 pounds, but, and maybe they were, maybe they were uh, taking care of more than one patient at a time. That would make sense as well. So anyway, riding the rope toe uh, or the T-bar, I can't, uh, with, uh, with this, this is, a, I'm sure, a, um, a, a homemade uh, rescue toboggan that the Otter Ski Patrol came up with. And then, uh, of course, the otters were a uh, very visible, very um, important part of the, uh, the early part of ski area. And there's a, we could do a whole two-hour session on the history of the Otter Ski Patrol. Um, there are several in the room probably right now, in addition to Joe LaFrancis. Go ahead and raise your hands. One, two, look at them all. Outstanding. Thanks. So if you look in the deep, uh, deep back corner of this picture, that we believe is the Ski Patrol building, um, which is basically where the ski club is now. You can see that the lift towers are in this picture are now made of steel. And the ski themselves, this is probably uh, early 50s. I don't know when they put steel towers in, but this is a little bit advanced from, uh, from the uh, earlier slides of the, of the uh, T-bar. There's the top of the T-bar, the infamous fourth tower where many of us would get off and ski through the woods so that we could ski lower B slope. And that's, that was our training venue when we were kids. Um, and then this section of the T-bar was uh, the fun section, uh, particularly over time when the cables wore out and instead of replacing, they would shorten them. That was fun. Um, another great shot of, uh, of an otter ski patrol standing at the base of B-Slope. So wartime, I got ahead of myself, but um, December 7th, 1941, uh, was a uh, substantial moment and the world changed for sure and uh, America's attention turned to uh, supporting the war effort. That included uh, Carl Acker himself, um, joined the 10th Mountain Division and served for three years overseas. Uh, Janet kept the ski area open during the war. Uh, there was access to Pico, veterans could ski for free. Um, there was a bus stop here, uh, and that's a Vermont Transit bus. <laughs> so skiing continued at least here at Pico during wartime. Sorry. This is actually the 10th Mountain Division in drill with a machine called a weasel. That was how they got through some of the mountainous terrain in uh, Italy. Um, and then the 10th Mountain Division logo. Uh, 10th Mountain Division is still uh, operates to this day, and they're based out of um, upstate New York. If you travel around ski country long enough, particularly in Vermont, to some of the older ski areas, you will find that there's someone, a patriarch of their ski program or a patriarch of their development uh, that dates back to the, to the um, 10th Mountain Division. Those folks loved, came back from Italy with a passion for skiing that has really helped all of us and helped the sport immensely. And we are grateful for not just their service, but what they brought uh, in terms of commitment to the sport. 
Here's Carl Acker, private Carl Acker, probably somewhere in Italy or possibly Colorado. The 10th Mountain Division was based out of Camp Hill where they did their training. So we have not identified the where, but he's surely in uniform. Uh, and then by 1945, um, he came back to Pico uh, and uh, took over the ski school again. And um, those years would be um, where uh, Carl and June were helping Janet run the ski area. Carl became a key employee both in terms of ski instruction. He was also a, me a mechanic. He was a technician. Uh, he had a lot of skills with tools. Unlike his son, Carl. <laughs> so, C Carl, you knew I was going to pick on you today. You picked on you. Okay. Great. You'll get your turn. Um, all right, so uh, skiing resumes. Carl is back, and uh, Picos takes off into some golden years. Um, the late 40s, uh, lots of ski instruction going on. At least two rope toes in this photograph. Um, and... Uh, smiles on faces. Um, the Carl Acker Ski School was well marketed, well known, well attended, and there's a great shot of Carl. This is Carl and June. They were married in 1948 and young Carl was born in 1949. They lived in the original base lodge, uh, which was called Troll Top. Carl will tell you some stories about it. Um, the second story could accommodate 10 skiers until they moved in and then they, they used it as their home. The downstairs was the base lodge, the cafeteria, if you will. We'll see some pictures of that. There's Carl and June and young Carl. There's a good shot of Troll Top. I actually remember in the late 60s when we were kids, we were, this was the Pico Ski Club building as well. So summer operations, um, Carl actually designed these seated chairs, and that is um, June Acker uh, on the right, and Carl, is that Janet on the left? No, who's on the left? Friend of my mother's. Friend of your mother's, fair enough. Um, so this is a marketing photograph to promote summer operations uh, in its early, early days. Um, all right, we're getting into the 1950s, and um, many of you were here in the 1950s and got to celebrate um, the accomplishments of young Andrea Mead Lawrence. This is her getting on a train. She went to her first Olympics in 1948 at the age of 15, and she scored in the top 10. Um, she was trained here at Pico by Carl Acker, and uh, you'll hear a little bit more of that, about that. Uh, there are so many pictures of Andrew Mead Lawrence um, when she was young uh, and, and again when she was accomplished, but these are just a few that we've collected. Um, this is actually a photo that was used on the Pico Trail map in the late 40s. This is before she became an Olympian, and we have color versions of this uh, um, that are uh, uh, floating around. We actually found a trail map from that era. Some of these are, uh, yeah, some of these are um, obviously. Um, Stage photographs, we can't tell whether this is at Pico or whether this is somewhere where she was uh, um, being photographed as part of her team activities. Um, this is a photograph that I walked past about two weeks ago uh, in Sun Valley. It's in the Sun Valley Lodge um, along the corridor with all kinds of other famous people. And there's four women racers in this photograph. Uh, the woman to Andrea's right is Gretchen Frazier, who was an Olympic medalist in 1948. So she was teammates with Gretchen. Another shot of Andrea. Uh, in, uh, Andrea met David Lawrence on the U.S. ski team, and they got married, I believe it was 19, it, was, it must have been 1950 50 or 51, um, because by the time she got to the 1952 Olympics, she was Andrea Mead Lawrence. So here it is, married in 1951. Thanks for the cheat sheet, Ann. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, then she, she became extremely competitive. She won everywhere she went. This is pre-Olympic. Um, I can't read the bib on it, on, uh, on it but her, the baskets on her poles and uh, the length of her skis and her, her, uh, her, th the, the age she appears in this picture puts it in the late 40s. The look of determination, you'll see that same face again when we show you a picture of her Olympic slalom run in 1952. 
There it is. <laughs> so, she wore bib number five. She actually raced in the Giants, downhill giant slalom and slalom. She won, uh, she fell in the downhill, she still finished, but she uh, won the, the giant slalom on Valentine's Day of 1952, and this is four days later, Jan uh, February 18th. On the first run, she hooked her tip, and she had to hike. And if you look on the YouTube, you can find a video of it where she actually had to hike at least three or four steps to get back in the course and finish. So she was almost two seconds out after the first run. And her second run uh, blew the field away by enough time to win the gold. So th here she is in 1952 on the, uh, on the gold medal podium. And this, uh, of course, is her second Olympics, but uh, the first where she medaled, and she medaled twice. There's her husband, David. Same bib five, that's slalom day. Uh, unsure if this is the same Olympics, but it probably is. When she got back to Rutland um, a few weeks later, they staged a parade in downtown Rutland, and it was a big deal. There were 2,500, 3,000 people lining Merchants Row. That is um, uh, Janet Mead in the car next to her. We haven't identified the others, but there may well be the mayor of the city in the car. Um, but this was a big deal. They had a big parade for her. They got gave her the key to the city. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, Rutland was very proud of their homegrown uh, daughter. She made the cover of Time Magazine that year. Um, this is, uh, uh, we don't have a date on it, but it was 1952. Um, and then she came back to Rutland and raised her kids. She had four kids, and she taught them all how to ski at Pico, except for Quentin. Quentin wasn't born until Andrea lived in California. And the story goes that um, uh, uh, Andrea skied in three Olympics, 48, 52, and 56 in Cortina. And then in 1960, she carried the torch into the Olympic Village while she was pregnant with Quentin. Uh, that's Quentin on the right. Those are the rest of Andrea's uh, kids with her. It's uh, Matthew, Cordy, Dee Dee, and Quentin. So 1951-52 was a boom year for Pico. Um, Carl Acker as the director, and uh, the rates had gone up significantly. A season pass for a full Monday, or midweek season pass was 35 bucks. Unlimited, 55, or you could just buy single rides for 40 cents a piece. <laughs> sure, that's, that's a good deal. Uh, uh, all right, so um, skiing is happening. There's been a, an expansion to the west. Um, you can now see there's another rope toe uh, to the west of the um, Constam T-Bar. Uh, and uh, we're, sh we're, we're pretty sure that we're skiing, uh, that the foreground skiing is on Lower Pike, also known as Sea Trail, but had been widened by this point. Cafeteria uh, over in the basement of the Troll House, and uh, we're pretty confident that's Andrea uh, right there, ordering a hot dog, breakfast of champions, I'm sure. 1950s T-Bar picture, we're still running uh, wooden towers wide open terrain, B slope on the left, A slope on the right, and then uh, a rope toe uh, off in the distance. Color change, so this is later on in the 1950s, clearly, probably during uh, uh, Carl and June Acker's period. So 19, uh, 1958, for the second time, Pico's ownership team lost their patriarch. So now, by 1958, this young ski area is being run, owned and run by a woman for the second time. Um, so that, uh, that moment um, obviously changed things dramatically, but Carl, of course, is recognized as Andrea's coach uh, in his World War II efforts with the 10th Mountain. Um, uh, he was recognized in this obituary in an appropriate way. So we love this picture because it really does show that uh, in the late 1950s, which you can tell from the ski equipment, um, Pico is starting to develop towards the pike. This is the, the lower pike. This is the first 
chairlift uh, that was installed at Pico, and June and um, or June and Carl did this. Just June. Yeah. So this is after Carl's death. Uh, there's a better picture of that same chairlift. Uh, its base is pretty near where the base lodge is going to end up. Uh, you can see the rest of the resort off in the background, but clearly June's goal is to get to the top, and this is the first step. In fact, uh, by the 1950s, June actually commissioned the cut to the top. There's no lift there, but this is June's contribution to we're going to the top. She invested in that for sure. And you can see the lower lift is in place. So that takes us to the next uh, major period of expansion here at PICO, the 1964 transition. Carl has a story about how his mother picked the Beldens. They didn't pick her. Um, so uh, the Beldens' uh, tenure begins in 1964. Bruce and Verlene had worked at Mount Snow. Bruce had, had been involved in mountain operations and development, and he was interested in um, buying a ski area for himself, and he had some investors. This picture was taken Thanksgiving weekend, 1964, when Bruce and Verlene skied the uh, T-Bar themselves. This was their first day uh, of ownership, according to Bruce. Uh, this is an interesting trail map from the early 60s. It shows proposed. So there are now mapping out where we're going. Um, and there's a lot of proposed in here. Um, but there's also a lot of a actually what's going on and, and what's been developed so far. But the dream was alive and well. Um, in June Acker's um, kitchen as she laid out these plants. So this, uh, the, did they, Carl, did they continue to use the Carl Acker Ski School name even after he died? It kind of looks like they did, but it's hard to tell when this one, this could have been an early 50s uh, trail map. Okay. Um, he didn't know what I was going to call him. Thought he was just thought he was just, I was just going to pick on him. So, um, Bruce and Verlene developed the Pico Base Lodge, um, which is now this iconic building that we're all gathered in today. Uh, kind of the uh, epi the um, epitome of what uh, a warm, comfortable, fun base lodge is supposed to be. Looking out this window, uh, this is what Pico looked like in uh, in the uh, post June Acker era and the early Belden era. The lower lift is running, but there's no lift to the top. But Bruce, we're going to change all that. And uh, he uh, hired a helicopter. This is laying towers in the uh, mid-60s for the summit chair. And now we're into the late 60s. The chairlift that June had installed has now been uh, replaced with uh, what I, we used to call the blue chair or Stan's chair. Um, and uh, it was, was that a hall, Frank? That was a hall. Uh, obviously, the base lodge is an active um, centerpiece of the resort. Uh, the parking has been expanded, uh, and uh, Pico is well on its way to being a, a, um, a destination ski area. Great shot from the top with the old summit chair, upper pike. Now, this is th there were two summit chairs before they built the... Um, the quad, it's the same infrastructure, but they had replaced the chairs themselves, I believe. And you can see in one of these photos where the, the new Doppelmayr chair hangers were installed. This would have been 1966 uh, or seven when uh, finally uh, the chairlift was completed to the top. And the marketing campaign for that year was we're on top. The outpost, installed in 1969, Everybody's favorite place to ski. It is uh, it is just an iconic part of skiing here, and uh, so that's the early early years of uh, outpost. So this picture has to be the birch glades because I don't think the outpost. Well, the outpost has uh, trellis towers, and the summit chair had trellis towers. So this has got to be the birch glades, and I do believe that's Brother Michael turning around to look at the photographer. Is that right, Michael? Standing right there. So that's Michael, who was a junior patroller here, skiing with one of his buddies. That'd be uh, mid-19, early 1990s. There's the Doppelmayr hangers 
uh, which now replaced the um, the uh, other hangers that we were looking at a minute ago. This is a summit chair. So 1981, open the Alpine slide. Do I have that right, Frank? Absolutely. Yes. Yep, we could change history, good. So in the early 80s, the Alpine slide came to town and that machine, or that, that uh, um, attraction, lasted 30 something years. It was a very success, had a very successful run. Um, lots of fun brought, uh, you know, brought some opportunity to, uh, for the ski area to keep good quality people, to have summer operations, a little food and beverage, but also bringing people to the mountains in the summer. Um, Little Pico Triple, we already talked about when it was installed in 1980, and it was the, uh, it was the workhorse for the Alpine Slide. All right, ski racing has always been important here. Andrew Mead Lawrence's legacy uh, tracked quickly to Rutland kids who wanted to learn how to ski, wanted to get competitive, and there were plenty of parents who were interested in that path for them. Uh, this is Ann Jones in the, uh, this would have been in the mid 19. 40s, late 1940s. She was a very competitive ski racer. Uh, she married Joe Jones, and they uh, were longtime coaches here at Pico at the ski club. This is a famous day for this young racer. Rebel Ryan was a uh, senior in high school in 1964, and he was winning championships around the Northeast. The Olympic team came back from um, Innsbruck, including Billy Kidd, Bill Moreau, Jimmy Huga, all the names that you heard. Uh, and, they, and Rebel got invited to race against them in Stowe one day. And uh, this is his actual run where he placed second behind Billy Kidd. And he, he beat Jimmy he beat Jimmy Huga, he beat Bill Merolt, he built, uh, beat all the other US ski team members, and this launched him onto a career that took him to, uh, to see the world and, um, and be part of the Olympic and the US ski team experience. These two kids, Rick and Susie Chaffee. You met their mother a little while ago. Uh, this is a great shot that was um, shared with us. The uh, Ski Foundation has a catalog of pictures from the Chaffees. Uh, yes, I've seen the pictures of Susie Chaffee in the silver suit a lot because she came here and showed, him, showed it to us. Um, so they, uh, th they were youthful skiers and Rick Chaffee tells the story of uh, the first time he was able to finish a race. He doesn't know if he won it or not, but his medal was given to him by Andrew Mead Lawrence and that made a lasting impression for him. Rick Chaffee went on to be quite the competitor himself. He skied in two Olympics um, and uh, was on the US team for, for uh, quite a while. Um, and uh, there was one uh, year where it was um, it was the finals of the World Cup out in uh, California, and the only person to beat um, Billy Kidd and Rick Chaffee was Jean-Claude Keeley that day. This is Susie Chaffee. She had a very competitive ski racing career, but obviously she became much more famous in television and advertising, and also in politics. She was the voice of Title IX in the 19, late 1960s and early 70s. And she has sat with and uh, been photographed with three different presidents, um, including Ford, um, uh, Gerald Ford, uh, Richard Nixon, and um, George H.W. Bush, George I. So she's uh, made her way around and really made her voice heard on behalf of uh, women in athletics and, uh, and, other, and other causes. Ski racing at the ski club um, just w has been a staple of the operations here. And uh, s you know, m many of these faces are Rutland High School, Mount St. Joseph Academy kids, John Higgins, the Higgins family, um, very successful family. One of the Higginses is still a coach in the ski club now. Um, this is Court Jones, that woman that, that we showed you earlier. This is her son, Court, this Ann Jones' son, Court, uh, became very competitive. Um, this young girl, Sarah Will, was a peer of, uh, of ours in the 70s, and she was a good skier. Um, but I, uh, uh, I love the fact that she's skiing in her dungarees in this picture, and, and her US ski team sweater. Um, this picture is uh, of, a, of a girl who can ski and can walk. But when she was in college, she had a very bad accident in Colorado, and she became paralyzed. Um, she started skiing on a mono ski shortly after that, and she became one of the most decorated U.S. skiers in history, winning over 10 
uh, gold medals in the Paralympics. And she is now a, a lifetime advocate for, um, for adaptive sports. She was one of our guest speakers when we opened the Andrew Mead Lawrence Lodge in 2013. So she's a PICO kid who's made it big as well. So the end of our slideshow is just to, uh, to show that this legacy of skiing and ski racing and what's happened here at PICO continues to this day. These are two PICO kids gazing out over some mountain out west and they're determined to conquer it um, even though they're probably 10 and 12 years old. Um, this is what PICO's done for young skiers is they've, is they've sent us out into the world uh, to conquer skiing anywhere we go. So with that, I believe we are ready to move on to the film, and that's the next slide. So thank you for listening. Before we put this film on, I have another quiz question. What three ski areas, in addition to Pico Peak, were patrolled by the Otter Ski Patrol? One. What? I've heard two of them. Wow, the obvious one, Killington. So Bird's Eye High Pond, Killington. And I don't know the answer to uh, Round Top. Does anyone know the answer to that one? All right, so we're going to go to the film section, hopefully. Brandon. Florence. We don't have any volume. Great, uh, it's great footage. We don't. We, maybe we could just narrate it. There's coffee. There's a girl drinking coffee. So the food and beverage here at Pico is legendary. Um, while we're looking at this, can anyone tell me what came with the Pico burger? Hootie burger was breakfast. Pico burger came with fr uh, chips and a pickle. And coleslaw. I think you're right. You guys enjoying this without sound? Yes. Great. Who knows what GLM stands for? Wow, good, good, knowledgeable crowd here. They, they're enjoying it. So what, uh, somebody under 50 has to tell me what the significance of the term Tower 10 is. If it be under 50, There's nobody under 50 here? Okay. 
That hurts. All right, I got another one. I know. I know. So, the daily snow report that Frank Heald called in every morning on the radio, Bonnie tells a story about how somebody asked her if she was married to Ben Frank because he says, this is Ben Frank Heald. Um, so, the question I have is, what three words did he say at the end of his radio sign-off when he uh, announced the, the snow conditions at Pico? The last three words of every time he called in. Come on. Frank, the Friendly Mountain. This is Ben Frank Heald at Pico, the Friendly Mountain. So this must be NASTAR up on, up on B Slope, off Tower 10. Neil McNeilis, legendary coach here from Pico. And Lynn Bertram from Suicide Six. Kurt Belden. So it wasn't everywhere in ski country that you had a couple of uh, um, pro racers who won, I don't know, among them, they probably won six or eight cars, uh, setting the pace every day for a NASCAR race. And the pace setters would run the course first, and then everyone would be handicapped off of that. Racing here. It was a big deal. And that's, I think that's Kurt on the right and maybe Kerry Adgate, former U.S. ski team on the, on the other side. All right, so I have a trivia question for you. Why is the trail off the summit named the 49er? 49th year, Kevin Creed. Anybody else? 49th trail. Anyone else? Frank? It was number 49 on our master planning trail list. <laughs> <laughs> so the science of trail naming. I want to know what didn't make the list. Yeah, 47 was scratched. Um, all right, so what three, name at least two trails in the history of Pico that are no longer on the trail map. Joker is a favorite. Swinger, it's another one. Any others? Charlie's Highway, Easy Street's still here. Can't, can't find it. All right, so with that, we're going to turn the microphone and the uh, presentation over to Justin Lindholm, and he's going to have some fascinating things to talk about, not just in terms of his family's experience with owning and operating a ski shop, but also with his experience with the, with the uh, Meads and their home at North Tower. Go ahead, Justin. Tom, you did a very good job on the uh, history of Pico. So I won't have to spend much time on that. We'll get mine over rather quickly. One thing I'd like to mention, especially for uh, you ladies in the room, this is the this month of March is Women's History Month. Now, as you have seen with uh, what Tom has said, we have some giants among the industry. It's not what you can't hear. I can't hear you. Okay. We have some giants among the industry with women as it has to do with Pico. We have Janet Mead. She actually ran Pico after Brad died uh, right at the beginning of World War II and all through World War II. Ski areas are among the hardest industries to operate anyway at a profit. A lot of ski areas in Vermont have gone under. A lot of ski areas everywhere have gone under. It is a horrible occupation. Frank Heal can actually get into it pretty good. 
Um, but Janet ran it through World War II. She even lost Carl Acker, her manager. She couldn't get help. Gasoline was rationed. So there is one giant lady as far as a historical woman, followed by June Acker. June Acker ran that place, and she had a rough time with the banking industry. And she knew what she was doing, but they wouldn't trust her. And my mother would tell me all about it as it was happening, and these ladies were, I mean, they just weren't treated well. Then we have, of course, we've got Susie Chappie, and then guess who? Andrea Mead, two gold medals. The first Americans ever to get Alpine gold medals was Andrea Mead. And Andrea, um, that record lasted for a long time. I don't know how many years before other Americans got gold medals, uh, two gold medals in an Olympics. She did it. That's not true. She still holds the record. Well, she, yeah, probably does. For In the same Olympics, two gold medals. Uh, she probably still has that record. And others have gotten gold medals, but um, like even Schifrin could not pull it off the last Olympics, um, which is, I think, stunning. But this is important to notice that we have some we have some historical giants here among the women in this thing. Now, another thing I want to get um, let you know is Carl Acker. The Meads picked Carl Acker out of a lot of people. They had money during the Great Depression. They went to Europe a lot. They looked for a ski instructor who would be as good as they could find. They found the best in the world. Carl Acker, when they pulled him out of Switzerland, he was on his way to get two gold medals in the Olympics of 1940. He was cheated out of that chance because there was no 1940 Olympics because of World War II. But to tell you how good he was, the woman he coached got two gold medals in the 1952 Olympics, which I'm sure Carl would think was even better than what he did because he helped her do it. So that was pretty good. Now I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on technology. Keep in mind, back in those days, before PICO and during the early years of PICO, a lot of people don't realize, modern people, because of the shaped skis, how tough it was to learn to turn a ski and they had no side cut. This is the old-fashioned ski right here. This is nine, before 1930. They had no steel edges. Uh, you had, that was your binding. It was a strap. It actually was kind of safe. You wouldn't break your legs so easy on this type of binding because you're going to flop out of this thing real quick. It would turn really good in powder snow because what you did was use your heel positioning I had my Uncle Alex always talk to me about heel positioning and these old bindings because he skied on them and I never could understand it. But um, this type of uh, ski was not good. Very little control. The only control you had was in regular powder. It would turn in powder because the ski would flex as it bent through the powder. That's the only way this ski ever turned. Then we got from the 1930s into 1930s, 40s, and 50s. This is the technology. This particular pair of skis here is U.S. Army 10th Mountain Division skis. This pair was made in 1944 by the Northland Ski Company. Now they've got steel edges. Now they've got what's called a bear trap binding. And a lot of people, you know, you hear about it all the time that you are stuck in a bear trap binding, and that's where you start breaking ankles, legs, everything all the way up to your neck. And they are adjustable, but you really have to know what you're doing. Each individual had better learn how to adjust them himself at home, at his leisure. You're going to file away your boots a little bit. You're going to work on this binding, and you will get it to release. But um, you're not going to get a ski mechanic who will do it for you. You're going to have to learn how to do that yourself. This type of ski still had no side cut like modern skis. The reason they couldn't put a side cut on these skis, or, um, the bend like they do now with a big shovel and a big tail and bend side in the middle, they can't, they couldn't do, um, keep the thing from twisting. And when a ski twisted, you'd lose all control at higher speeds until they came out with a Kevlar wrap, 
which is in a modern ski. That technology has really made it a whole lot better to ski. In the old days, they also had these wider baskets on the poles. They had to have wide baskets, and I've seen them even wider than that. Uh, this is Northland poles. Uh, because you're going to sink a regular modern pole, you couldn't ski on those kind of conditions back then. Um, it would go right down. Uh, it's just too soft of snow they were skiing on. Grooming, there was no such thing. They had packing. They would have these tractor-like packers that would pack the trails. And before that, the only way you packed a trail was to climb sideways up the hill. <laughs> Everybody got together and they packed their little trail for the day and that was that. So basically, that's all I wanted to go through. Uh, some of the equipment. Oh, the other thing is boots. <laughs> boots stunk. They were. <laughs> when I was a. Th this is a double boot. You had to lace up the inside boot and then the outside boot. And us kids never had an inside boot. And let me tell you something we would freeze our feet in minutes <laughs> with just plain leather on your feet as a kid. That, that was bad. But um, when they came out with a plastic boot, uh, they solved a lot of problems, except for rear entries. Those could go right in the garbage right from day one. <laughs> now, we're going to have um, Dave Wright going to talk about Long Trail Lodge. They had no lodging when they started off at Pico. It was like, where were you going to stay? They had people coming up by trains. Um, they were looking for places to stay close by, and there really wasn't any. So. I don't, would you like to... Um, Can you talk a little bit about the technique? The technique? Okay, the technique, yes, this is good. <laughs> to, turn, to turn these skis, you actually, when you got done thinking, you got done doing it right, you forgot how you're doing it, but you are now doing it right. You had to use your knees, you had to hips, butt, back, and shoulders all had to be in unison to get that ski to turn. It took me forever to learn that. They always say the women learn better than the men because their butts stuck out farther. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but that was one of the theories. So, Ju Justin, how do you, how do you, how do you get those, how do you, how do you get those figure eights up there? How do you do that? Oh, that's two people doing figure skating or figure skiing. They did figure skating and figure skiing. And this, this sort of thing is a figure skiing thing. I don't think they're competing with each other. They're just trying to, to um, see if they can avoid each other while skiing close to each other all the way down the hill and come up with a nice design. And um, so that, uh, that was cute. North Tower, I'll just mention it quickly. I grew up at North Tower, just like Andrew and Mead grew up at North Tower. I started skiing at North Tower. Andrew and Mead started skiing at more North Tower. I turned out to be a nothing, and she got two gold medals. So something's missing with me. You haven't figured it out yet. Um, North Tower was designed by Brad Mead. He um, was an architecture student at Norwich University. This is way back in the woods. It's over half mile road getting to it. It's got beautiful cliffs all around it. This picture is taken from one of the cliffs. It's not taken from an airplane. There's cliffs all around. It's a beautiful place, but hard working. You've got to work a lot. They sold it in 1940 because they were moving everything to um, Pico. It was difficult for them to go up and down that road. That road is a horrible road going up to it. Steep and narrow and winding. And um, we put a lot of cars off in the ditches trying to get up that thing in the wintertime. And sometimes you just didn't make it. You walked the whole half mile. And um, anyway, it's a beautiful place, very private. They liked privacy back then. And Andrea Mead always loved that place. She would come and visit uh, my mother uh, whenever she was in town to look at the castle or North Tower. And uh, a very beautiful, enchanting place designed by uh, the husband. And I will say one thing on the... Um, this over here is where Brad Mead did his, that's his, the chapel or his art room. That's where he did the paneling that he, he painted off. He was also a painter. He painted the paneling of what he wanted Pico to look like and he convinced um, Mortimer Proctor to let him lease the land from many paintings, big murals he created and put around that one room. Um, and it's a good thing that he got him got into Pico, and a good thing Mortimer Proctor let him. 
a lot of foresight there, both, both men. So, Justin, before you step down, uh, I'd open the floor up. J Justin has a, an incredible amount of information and knowledge about the, how the, the ski technology evolved over time. Justin, what was your favorite uh, ski of all time? Oh, mine was the uh, Kessley National Team Slalom. And I will tell you that Americans hate stiff skis. Only the real competitors like the stiff skis. I grew up on stiff skis leaning back the Jean-Claude Keeley method. And people hate that. They don't like that leaning back because it is a little uncomfortable to get used to. But it is quick and you can turn a ski very quickly and it's good for high speed. But most Americans want their skis a little noodly. Now the modern skis really are good at high speed. I tested some of the first ones made and uh, I mean, I could slam right down the trails. I was very happy they didn't shatter. Even the, the Rosinol 104 was their entry level ski. My Lord, you could, you could race down the hill on those things. So the, it's a, these modern skis are really good. They just don't dig in on ice as well as the old ones. <laughs> so uh, any thoughts, questions for Justin before we move and talk to David? They'll be here. Sure. What were the early skis? What kind of wood was it made of? This particular one is chestnut. It's very light. Uh, looks like oak, but a lot lighter than oak and has a lot of toughness. Unfortunately, chestnut trees are basically almost extinct. That building still looks basically like it does in that picture. It's owned by uh, wealthy out-of-staters who are very private. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Above the apple orchard. It's in behind the apple orchard. So, any other questions? Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. One at a time. Raise your hand. I'll call on you. Then we can read. Yes. Did Mortimer Proctor sell the land to the state and then FICO leased the land from the state? No. Mortimer leased it to the Meads and then later sold it to the Meads. Uh, the part that they wanted which included the, the top of the mountain. So that was pretty good. Uh, I don't think the state got in there at all. Now, they had a lot of other land too that I think eventually went to the state. But the ski area acreage that the Meads wanted, I think he sold it to them. The Meads were not poor. They had money. We got that part from the Davos picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, the question's interesting because uh, if you go around ski country in Vermont, a lot of ski areas operate on either state or federal land, and this was unique um, in terms of uh, uh, private land because it came through the, through the uh, proctors. Um, so Justin, what about ski bindings? I'm sure you had uh, days where people would walk in with a bag full of you know, things and say, can you make bindings out of this? Well, I, I learned from one of the best ski technicians there that existed. Uh, he started skiing back in the early 30s, uh, Francis Renner, and he would, people would bring in a bag with all the binding parts from bindings that all kinds of companies made bindings back then. We wouldn't even know who the binding company was or no jigs, no instructions, nothing. We would actually mount those bindings. Um, Francis Renner taught me how to do it. Now the liability is so massive, you can't touch stuff like that. You've got to be certified for each individual brand of binding now. Uh, so it's a lost art that, um, uh, too bad I can't do it anymore, but the last set was a guy bought them on the internet, and boy did he end up with a couple of pieces of junk. And uh, he wanted them mounted, so I mounted those babies for him. I told him, don't sue me. And that was the end of that one. Uh, before we move on to David, any other questions from the audience for Justin? Raise your hand. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for that perspective. <laughs> and uh, you can hand it to, uh, to David. And David, tell us, uh, tell us uh, your contribution to this story. Well, I want to say first what a trip it's been. From you got to use the microphone, my friend. Nobody can hear you. What a trip it's been from the beginning of the uh, slideshow uh, to what we have now around us. Uh, the development of PICO is, uh, is in some ways miraculous. But let's go back to the beginning again because this represents uh, the years, a few years before PICO was started. 
This is from the 20s, probably, and um, excuse, excuse me, the 30s. Um, and this beautiful rustic building was built in 1923, uh, financed by Mortimer Proctor, probably on land that he donated to the Green Mountain Club. If you don't know about the Green Mountain Club, look it up because they are the ones that created the Long Trail, starting in 1910, finishing it uh, just a few years after the clubhouse was built in the in the late 20s. Uh, a beautiful rustic building uh, built, built by um, an incredible genius, uh, Paul Fair, who lived in Wallingford and who had uh, a lot of experience in building rustic buildings before. He did Long Trail Lodge and, and he and others consider uh, Long Trail Lodge to be his, his masterwork. Um, I, I, I have to say you had to have been there, but the photographs do um, give you some idea. Uh, how this figures into Pico was that it was there in 1937 when uh, Brad and uh, Janet started Pico, but there were no places to stay uh, in the immediate area, and Long Trail Lodge was right next to Pico. So um, my uncle, who was the manager at the time, Grover Wright, uh, he got the idea to keep the, this lodge open for the winter. Uh, the first season. Well, it was a it was a miracle and a disaster, you'd have to say, because it it was practically unlivable. Um, it was heated by a wood furnace down in the lowest level of this building, and the the guest rooms were up on the top level. So not much heat got up there. So guests would wake up and find a snowdrift coming in and out the, under the door. Any water in the room would be frozen. The toilets froze. The Pipes, every pipe froze in the place more than once during the winter, and uh, and yet it was a su success in that it was um, it was well received, and it was really a good asset for the early in, uh, Pico uh, development. There was a trail that came down from the top of the T-bar down to the lodge, and then another trail that went down to the base from uh, in front of the lodge. So uh, guests really could. Uh, access the ski area without getting into their automobiles and getting them started in the winter was another issue too in those days um, uh, but the fact that it wasn't uh, really workable in the winter led uh, Grover to go back to Mortimer Proctor with a proposition to build what uh, became known as the uh, chalet or the annex or, or several different names for it the building that is still there and is now uh, the Inn at Long Trail. Uh, and I must say that the uh, in, inside of the Inn at Long Trail is very much like it was uh, back in the day that it was built. Uh, the main um, lobby area, the dining room, and uh, the kitchens and, and the rooms upstairs. All, all of it's been modernized over the years. Uh, and of course, the biggest uh, uh, change in asset to the building has been the development of the of the uh, Irish pub and the McGraths take <laughs> take great they take great credit for that. that that turned it into a real ski lodge because before that it was a, a deal where uh, people brought their own booze and and uh, there was a hot buttered rum by the fire uh, on Saturday evenings that was complimentary but otherwise it, it was a, a different kind of atmosphere than than what we have now in uh, your modern uh, ski lodges. Uh, Grover uh, was uh, enthusiastic about Pico and developed a strong relationship with the Meads and with uh, Carl and June. Uh, so strong that uh, after Carl died and after Grover's wife died, they got married. Uh, so it went on for, for another 20 years. Um, but uh, Carl and, and Grover worked together to promote not only Pico but, but the Long Trail Lodge uh, to the extent that they had a huge bull billboard built along uh, the Adirondack Northway coming up from Albany and from down country that said, uh, Ski Pico, and underneath it it said, Stay at Long Trail Lodge. So that, that was an early collaboration and um, it worked out well for both of them. Um, the, uh, the, the chalet um, was, was, a, was the, the second ski lodge in Vermont, the first one being up at Stowe 
in what had been a CCC camp. Um, and it was a quintessential ski lodge in its day. Uh, it catered uh, a lot to ski clubs from down country, and some of them came by train to Rutland and came up the mountain in a bus or some kind of a, a, a jitney. You saw the early picture of the Vermont Transit bus. The road was a two-lane, uh, it was paved by that time, it was a two-lane road, um, and keeping it open in the winter was, was a lot more difficult than it is today, uh, bad as it is now. So sometimes skiers were isolated up here uh, for long periods of time. I remember one guest who broke his leg and stayed for the entire season. <laughs> Fortunately, he was able to do that, I don't know. But, um, I guess that's about all I have on, on this end. Let me uh, ask a couple questions of you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, who, who taught you how to ski? Uh, I d actually had lessons from Carl, Carl, Carl Sr. You gotta uh, use the, you gotta when, use the mic we first, first, we first, yeah, we first moved to Vermont in 1953. Can uh, use the microphone, there you go. Yeah. So everybody can hear you. When the fam my family first moved here, um, one of the first things that we did was learn how to ski. And so, because uh, we were just a half a mile from the ski area and we could walk to the area and back to our house. I've got you um, at about 10 years old, maybe eight years old when Andrea won her medals. Uh, that's right. And then, yeah. uh, and then um, tell us about the Pico Winter Carnival. Well, that was a, uh, a fixture that I, I'm sort of surprised that didn't come up in the slideshow or wasn't mentioned before. There was a collaboration between Pico and Rutland that was uh, uh, indicated by that uh, newspaper page that had all the congratulatory encouraging ads for Pico because it was soon seen that it, the resort industry was industry was what was going to carry uh, Rutland uh, in, after the big uh, companies like the, the marble company went out of business uh, we still need to employ people and and Pico became an industry and then of course Killington added even more to that uh, but there was a uh, but the Pico winter carnival every every winter during the 50s at least I don't know when it began or when it ended um, and it featured uh, the Pico Derby which was a downhill race down Sunset Shush uh, I guess you had to walk up there to get into the race but it was open to anybody and the first couple of years uh, it was the first year it was won by uh, I think Dartmouth or Norwich or UVM athlete skiers but by the second year uh, it was won by, by local people who were in the Pico uh, Ski Club and maybe in the Otter Ski Patrol. Uh, Brad Mead came in second uh, just about every year, which was, which was pretty good for an amateur. What are we looking at in this picture, David? What, th this is Rick Chaffee, a picture that he shared with us, um, and I, I think that's going on during the Winter Carnival. I have no, I have no idea. Oh, oh sugar on snow. There you yes. go. <laughs> yeah, Rick. Rick is enjoying sugar on snow. If you don't know what that is, it's kind of a taffy made from boiling maple syrup to a, 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 a another consistency. So when you when you have a, um, a sugar on snow party like is going on here outdoors, uh, they've made a snow bench, probably using a backhoe or a, uh, a front end loader. They've moved piles of snow and, and then it becomes uh, leveled off and squared off. They boil, um, maple syrup over an open fire and bring pitchers of hot syrup over to the snow bench, pour it on the snow, and people come up with with spoons, wooden spoons that are furnished, and you just can eat and eat and eat. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun, especially for kids. I, I, I would say Rick is, looks a little old for it, not really into it, the way some of the little kids were. Uh, but there's a great story in, uh, in Linda Goodspeed's um, book called uh, Pico F the First 50 Years about how my uncle Grover and um, Oren Bates who was a uh, Sherburn fixture that uh, a farmer uh, the select board chair um, road commissioner uh, and uh, I think he also was a cemetery commissioner uh, he did everything in, in Sherburn and uh, he also worked at Pico and uh, he and and Grover were in charge of doing the sugar on snow for a particular carnival and they had it all set up with the benches and the 
tripod boiling the sap over the open fire. And meanwhile, up on the, on the lower part of its a slope, they were getting ready for the uh, fireworks that evening. And um, they took a sled loaded with fireworks up the T-bar, and they must have gotten off halfway or something and brought it over, and we're getting ready to set up what would be the fireworks display later in the evening, and somehow the sled broke loose and went careening down the slope. It's told in Linda's book. It went right through the fire, <laughs> and, it's, it, it, and someone said that the kettle bounced up and down and that the syrup actually came up out of the kettle and then went right back in, losing nary a drop. Now, it, I think that sounds like a, a story that was told up at the end at Long Trail Pub later on. But the, the, the crisis was averted. The fireworks did not go off. Um, David, uh, you met Janet Mead uh, as a kid. Yes. Was friends with your, yeah. with your parents and your uncle. Friends of my parents and, and my uncle and her aunt. How, uh, how, would Grover, so. how would you describe her? Well, she was, I said she was from a different world, really, I think. And when you see photographs of her, the way she dressed, the way she talked, she had a, a kind of a, an accent. Uh, she was from another place, really. And, uh, and, 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 and from New York. And she was, I would say she was somewhat, somewhat imperious. Uh, I, I'm sure Kyle can remember a lot more about her than I did. She was a lot more exposed to her, and he'll tell you more about it. But, uh, you know, she was a great lady, I would say, and uh, her bravery in taking on running this uh, outfit after uh, her husband died is an indication of that. She was going to carry through on his, their dream, you know, later on. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions from the floor for David? So, um... David, I have uh, one. You told me a story the other day. Um, when we, those of us who skiers and we travel a little bit, you might be on the chairlift or you might visit somebody and they say, oh, I know Pico or I, I used to ski at Pico or I know somebody from Pico. Do you have any stories of your travels where you've run across other Pico skiers? Yeah, that was um, this winter of uh, 75 and I was, uh, I was out in Aspen as a ski bum, so to speak, working in a restaurant and skiing every day and really enjoying it out there. And one day uh, uh, at the top of Aspen Highlands, uh, I noticed a gaggle of people around some apparently celebrity and they were filming it and whatnot. So I went over to see who it was and who, who, who was it? Of course, it was Susie Lipstick Chaffee. <laughs> so I had to hang around and, and uh, introduce myself to her, not knowing whether she would actually know who I was, but with a few references from people in the area, uh, she soon caught on, and she was very congenial and very friendly, I have to say, for a celebrity. <laughs> uh, one, one more question for you before we per turn the mic over. Um, do you know, are there plans to preserve uh, and interpret uh, the, the Long Trail Lodge site for public access? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I'm on a committee with the Killington section of the Green Mountain Club that is now working trying to work with Killington, which owns the, owns the uh, site uh, because they bought the whole property here uh, on this side of the mountain uh, years ago. And we're trying to get permission to go into that site and clean it up to some extent um, and create some trails and put up some signs and give people a chance to go in there and, and see it uh, in a safe way. Uh, and understand what was there before. Because you will get an idea just walking through the site uh, as to how it went when you look at a picture. Outstanding. Well, thank you, David. Any other questions from the floor? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and, and the historian Ann reminds me to tell you that the, the, uh, the, the, the lodge burned in 1968. That's why we're looking at foundations. Uh, it was a disastrous fire and um, uh, ir you know, an, an irreparable uh, building to re recover from. Yes, question. What can we do to support that effort? What can we do to support that effort is the question, David. Well, uh, it'll be publicized and if you're, uh, 
if you're talking about Vermont media, you'll you'll learn about it, and then there may be some suggestion about what you can do at that point. We're in the beginning stages right now. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right. So, a um, couple quick questions. Show uh, show of hands. Nobody's under fifty, so that that kind of solves that problem. Um, how many of you competed or uh, participated in the Pico Derby? One, two, three. All right, and they're signing autographs later. <laughs> so Bonnie Coopley, Carl Acker, and what? Ah, awesome. Um, let's see. What is the former name of the triple slope? Gnomes Knoll. Gnomes Knoll. Everybody knows that. Okay. That was an easy one. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Carl, you, the floor is yours um, to share your, yeah. <laughs> What's the bucket? Oh, the bucket. Yeah, got it. Let's take a 10 second stand up and stretch. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Okay, there's more. You ready? Everybody take your Prevagen this morning? I just took a couple before I sat down here. Everybody get their raffle ticket in? It's a secret. I'll tell you in a minute. Thank you all for coming. This is beyond impressive. A lot of friendly faces here. Hope I don't kick the bucket. A lot of friendly faces, a lot of longtime Pico skiers. So I would just start off by saying to all ski enthusiasts and Pico lovers that are here today, if I'm elected, FICO will be open seven days a week. I can't hear you. Rich, you're on that. And there will be a quiz on this presentation after. So, a um, couple of, a lot of, lot of mead, mead stories here, and I have a, a couple. Just about everything that's been said so far, you can find it on the internet, in a book. Um, people posed questions on a Killington local site last night and somebody posted a thing, you can just click on it and uh, read everything that everybody said already. So thanks for stealing all my <laughs> material, gentlemen. Um, one recent story from 2018 when the the Meads were inducted into the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, which was at the Grand Hotel at Killington. And so quite a number of Mead family members were able to attend, and I was there with my wife. And after all the presentations were made for all the different um, people, they, um, the Mead family got together for some pictures. and. Andrew Mead's brother Peter was there and some of his children and there was little children named Brad Mead that I met and Andrea's children that could make it. And so they invited me to come into the picture. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So they took the pictures and then after we got done, we're all kind of in a circle and I said, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if it wasn't for Brad and Jane and Mead, none of us would be here. And all the older folks are going, yeah, yeah, we get that. And some of the younger ones are going, well, how do you fit into the picture here? And then the older ones schooled them on the fact that Brad and Jane had brought my father here from Switzerland. So, you know, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I get that. So anyway, that was, for me, that was kind of a fun little moment to see the looks on their faces. A very recent story um, that happened in February. This is continuing with the Mead stuff. Um, 
Our daughter, who um, is a ski instructor at Deer Valley, follow, following in her grandfather's footsteps, um, had a private lesson one day in February. She's riding up the chair, or getting on the chair, and a woman asked if she could join, and they said, sure. So they're going up the chair, and Carly and her lesson were talking about Vermont. So the other person, the other passenger, looked over on Carly's name tag, and it said, Carly Acker, Killington, Vermont. So she goes, do you know Carl Acker? <laughs> Carly says, yes, that's my father. She goes, well, I'm Muffy Mead, and Brad and Janet Mead were my grandparents. <laughs> so what are the odds of two grandchildren from two Pico owners getting on the same chair at Near Valley, Utah in 2023? Pretty slim. Pretty slim. Okay. Did everybody get a ticket in the raffle bucket? I'll just, we'll draw the raffle. Oh, you got another one? Okay, two for one. So after I'm done my presentation, um, I took the liberty, I'm going to raffle off a on-ski, whenever we can get it together, an on-ski an on snow tour, history tour of Pico with me. Relatives are not eligible to win. <laughs> okay. So, I have some questions for Carl. Carl. So, yes. you, you grew up as an only child in the 1950s here on this campus. Can you cue up that other picture, please? Uh, one. I would just bounce around as the, yeah, yeah. As the, as the so pictures what, come up. What, so I wanted to know what was that like? You were all by yourself up here all four seasons. What was that like? Can you put up that other picture? Which one? <laughs> which, which other picture? The one of the um, toll top. Oh. Oh, too, sorry. Too you're far away. Yeah. You're in charge of this? Okay. Too far away. Um, well, being an only child and having your parents owning a ski area in the winter time, I took a lot of liberties to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> Frank Heal might attest to the fact that, well, you still are, so anyway, that's okay. <laughs> this is my parents on their wedding day. The Kerback brothers might recognize this gentleman here. That's my grandfather, and Neil Robinson, and Paul Villar, and some other ski people that were in the 10th Mountain Division. But what was it, the question was, what was it like for me growing up here, 10 miles from the next closest children to play with? <laughs> well, it sucked. <laughs> the next closest kids were the Casellas from the Casella family. They owned the motel partway down the road, which is now called the Killington Pico. And so they had a swimming pool. <laughs> So we would take turns, they'd, they'd come up here, I'd go down there, and their dad was building the motel at the time, so we'd chip bricks and get them ready for him to put them up, and then we could go swimming. And then there were some kids from Rutland that I went to Catholic school. See the scars on my back? Oh. Um, and my mother drove me to school every day for eight years during the winter. There's so many directions I can go in here with this conversation. All right. So, Carl, I mean, let, me, let me see if I can keep you on task. Yeah, you can't because it's this just too much. Fun. All right. So I want to talk about this picture, which um, you, know, you were a ski coach your whole career, and I wanted to just kind of analyze this picture with you a little bit. I don't see your downhill <laughs> hand reaching for your next turn. So tell us about the physical aspects of skiing in the 1950s, and, and tell us what's wrong with this particular athlete's uh, technique. Well, actually, that's technically very correct. <laughs> Edge angle, knees, hips, shoulders facing down the hill. That, at four years old, is uh, about as good as it gets. Woo! That picture was in the uh, 
New York Times on the sports page back in whatever year that was, 54, 53. I actually have the, if you don't believe me, I have the copy at home. <laughs> oh no, it's in the vault. So I wanted to ask you about snowfall. Did it snow more in the 50s and 60s? Yes and no. I'll tell you about, well, you asked me before about what it was like growing up kind of isolated. I had, I had a cast of workers here that worked for my parents that I could pick on. And we had a, a constant, you know, bantering back and forth. And I, I, need to, I need another picture up here to show you where I lived. I can't, I can't get that for you. It's too far back in the Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Okay. Oh. You ask and you shall receive. Yes. So this is what was called Troll Top, which was the first ski house right at the base of the mountain. Back then, people rent. This is where we occupied this later after my parents bought the mountain. And do you have your pointer? Yep. That window right here, over there. Oh, there you go. That was my bedroom window <laughs> growing up for 14 years, of, first 14 years of my life. And so I had this perfect view. So we're looking at being over there, looking this way towards Little Pico. What could be better? First ski in, ski out condo. You know, what can I tell you? Um, so a lot of, a couple of interesting things that happened here when I was a kid, when I was a little devil was this was the the entrance double door into the um, cafeteria area which I'm not sure what was in there at that point but warming hut so there was a big roof on the back here and there was always a lot of snow as you, this was one of the years that had snow that this story came from so one of my devious little fun things to do was there was a set of stairs, and that's how we got to our house. They came up the side, and we go across the front, and that was the entrance into the apartment. So I would get up there and had a snow shovel, and I would wait, and I'd listen. And when I heard the door open that people were going to come out, <laughs> I hooked the snow over the balcony and covered them up. Well, that went on for a little while. People would chase up the stairs. I would run in and lock the door, go like this. And then the word got around to my parents, so that was the end of that. So the proximity from that building to the lift terminal was 30 yards, 40 yards, pretty close. So there was this guy, and you're gonna read this in anything you're gonna read out there. These are never to be spoken of again stories. <laughs> so there was this a guy, an employee of the mountain that he liked to tease me a lot. And one year when there was a lot of snow, I don't remember which one it was, the space between, over here was the parking lot, if, if you will. And then they, he would come in every morning about daylight and walk across and he would go in and start up the, diesel engine for the T-bar and uh, get things ready for the day. So one year, I don't remember, I was probably seven or eight, on the path that he would walk every morning, I decided one evening after maybe my parents were out at a meeting or something, I go out in this short stretch like from here to the window and I get a shovel and I dig this as far deep down a hole as I could four or five feet down. Get some cardboard boxes from the restaurant, cover it up, put the snow back over it, spread the rest of the snow around. So the next morning, here comes the lift operator guy with his lunchbox. Dee, 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 dee. And I'm up early to watch this, right? And he falls in the hole. And you can see his lips going. And he gets out of the hole, and anyway, I got my laugh, and you know, I had to go to school. So my mom says, you know, let's go get ready for school, and 
Later that day, every day when I would come home, I would, I would um, get my ski stuff on and, and go ski until the t bar closed, and then I would hike up and down with other kids. So I come skiing up to the t bar to load on, and the guy comes out and he's looking at me. He goes, "You little son of a bitch." <laughs> We're on, we're on national TV. You can't say stuff like that, Carl. So you little son of a gun. So Carl, I have one more question because we have one more speaker. And shocking, you went over your time. <laughs> I applied for extra time. I have a record of it right here. On my so my my question for you is, what's your favorite trail? Boy, that's a tough one, Tommy. I would have to. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> It would be the KA Trail. Awesome. Uh, all right, so um, anyone have any quick questions for, for Carl before we invite our last speaker? We're, uh, we're but wait, there's more. <laughs> we're almost on schedule. Any questions for Carl? Yes. How did your parents meet? Thank you. So incorporated with... Justin's story and David's story of the Long Trail Lodge. My mother, who was from Rutland, um, worked as a waitress at the lodge in the summertime. And my father, while he was running a ski school and whatnot in the winter, also worked up there as a carpenter in the, in the summertime, and that's how they met. And the rest of it I can't talk about. All right, so Carl, would you hand the microphone to our final speaker and uh, we'll get to uh, hear the perspective from Frank Heald, whose legacy um, is, uh, is uh, most people in this room know about. Oh, wait, um, wait, 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 wait. We'll wait, get back to you, <laughs> Wait. We can do the drawing. Oh, you want to do the drawing now? Yes. Okay. You want Frank to draw the Because I'm going to pass out in a minute. <laughs> All right. Okay. So everybody get their ticket out. So I would just say this, if you have the winning ticket and you're not able to or interested in participating, because you might get a free ski lesson along with it, um, then, then say I'll have to pass and we'll draw another name, another ticket. Go for it. Okay. Everybody understand the rules? Yes. <laughs> And the winner is? So, 169. It goes 842169. Okay, time's up. Next. <laughs> Nobody? Come on, come on. We got a winner. You guys already did that with me once. All right. Okay, I'll see you after. So, um, we're going to try and get back to the formality of this presentation and uh, hand the microphone off to Frank Heald. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Carl. Are we on? Thank you. Um, most everything that I had on my list to say has either been said by the uh, moderator or the other folks. So I'm just going to catch up on a couple of things. Does anybody in the room, does, does anybody in the room remember Oren Bates? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one part of David's story that he missed, which I think is the best part, uh, I was proofing Linda's book. My wife came home and found me laughing hysterically on the couch and asked me why. Because at the end of that story, Oren is quoted as saying, it was the goddamnedest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and he had to know Oren to understand that one. Um, as the oldest of the uh, presenters, I think, I represent the more modern time of Pico. Bonnie and I came to uh, Pico as a couple in 62-63 uh, to help with racing and uh, junior program. Um, 
a couple of years later, I found myself president of the ski club, and then ended up um, as race chairman for a number of years before I joined Bruce and Verlaine uh, in 1971. And I represent Pico Peak Ski Resort Inc., which uh, until '95, when I left the area, um, that was the operating company. During the time I was here, um, virtually everything, or during the Pico Peak Ski Resort days, uh, everything that you see here today is stuff that we built, buildings, lifts, uh, and so on. The, some of the amusing things, I guess, um, our marketing theme in the, in the early 70s was, we're all natural. Um, and then came 73, 74. No snow, no gas. Um, in, at Christmas week, there was a picture in the Rutland Herald of a dog playing in the mud out front here. <laughs> Needless to say, we found God, bought a head coat, a bunch of aluminum pipes, and made snow on the triple slope, or what we called Gnome Snow in those days. The following summer, we got serious and put five and a half miles of snowmaking in the ground. And that was interesting. Um, the T-bar replacement in 1980 was followed by the Alpine Slide. And while we had been doing uh, banquets and weddings and so on, we were interested in adding to the, uh, the summer income. An interesting fact about that. One Martin Luther King birthday weekend from Friday through Monday with particularly good skiing, I realized that we'd gross more money than we did all summer working our tails off. However, it did provide some employment for many folks. Some of our accomplishments uh, in the early 80s, the uh, PICO management to the PICO board of directors um, agreed to uh, work on the development of what is now the Alpine Pipeline Company, which is a sewer pipe that runs from the top of, Al uh, of Sherburn Pass down into Rutland City. Um, integral to cleaning up the city's watershed and um, integral to the future of the development that we're talking about on the other side of the hill uh, in the future. Um, it's most important. Um, in the 89-91 era, I spent a couple of years over at Killington as the um, as the vice president of development or some doggone thing, and we spent two years working on the or trying to get the easement uh, for the Alpha, for the uh, Long Trail AT corridor uh, taken care of. Uh, quite honestly, that was finished uh, after I left the company. There's a couple of organizations that have been integral to, to PICO's history. The Otter Ski Patrol, which uh, found its first uh, spot over in Shrewsbury, uh, which is where skiing actually started in this area. They followed the folks over to Cream Hill Road, which preceded PICO, and um, have been an integral part or were an integral part of the PICO operation uh, until the late uh, 2000s, early 2000s. The other organization that I feel very strongly about is the PICO Ski Club. Um, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, most of our friends' children, the Akers, the Olmans, the Higginses, um, all grew up skiing uh, on a regular basis, and most of them became racers. The funny thing, uh, in those days, the, uh, when the kids were, were uh, young, they were at uh, Christ the King and MSJ for school, and we convinced the school administration that if they'd simply let the kids out so that they could train in the afternoon, we'd provide uh, championship trophies. And believe me, folks, there's nothing a Catholic school likes more than championship trophies. 
So that was kind of the creation, if you will, of the of the Everyman Ski Team or Ski Racing Program, which exists today, where uh, youngsters don't have to be in the academy setting. That's not to say that the academies aren't great, but a youngster can progress here uh, with the Pico Ski Club and now with the excellent uh, assistance of the uh, Pico Ski Educational Foundation. There are a couple of three things that were particularly interesting. You saw some pictures of the pro races. Those were exciting days. Um, Needless to say, um, I will share one story, and I, I've told this with with Kurt Belden. When uh, he won the lease of a Cadillac out at uh, Jack Frost, um, my friend Bill Stanger <laughs> called me and said, "Is this a good thing to uh, lease?" And I said, "Well, Bill, you better insure it heavily because it will come back in the back of a dump truck." <laughs> And it did about, about a week before the uh, about a week before the lease ended. Uh, uh, Kurt T-boned somebody and ruined that jobber. Um, one of the exciting things that seems to have passed in history with us is the uh, during the Lake Placid Olympic Games, the Swiss and Liechtenstein teams uh, trained here, and at the time our snow our snowmaking supervisor with a lad named Rudy Zeidler, and Rudy assured me that he was a German, not an Austrian. Um, but uh, he lived his, he was really in his heyday through that period. Um, a couple of interesting things, uh, Ingmar Stenmark did some wax training on the lower pike, uh, or wax testing, uh, so that he was getting different snow uh, senses. And the, uh, the one thing that some of the youngsters, who are probably now almost 45 years old, um, the Canadian downhill team stopped by here for a, a, a day, and um, they autographed a whole bunch of our junior racer skis. A couple of other things, and I know I'm going to miss somebody, but uh, we had... Um, we have some interesting folks that have graduated from our employment. Um, Tom Aker uh, is, uh, and when I say employment, association with the ski area, Tom Aker is general counsel for the, uh, for the uh, National Ski Area Association. Uh, Bill Cohen, Supreme Court Justice Bill Cohen, uh, cut his teeth uh, with Hilmar Golseth down in the uh, down in the rental shop. Uh, Eric Gothier was our slide doc, first aid guy on the slide one summer. He is now an interventional cardiologist at Physicians Hospital in uh, Plattsburgh. The quick amusing story. A person was buying a, a lift ticket out front from from uh, our ticket seller, and the person behind him leaned over his shoulder and said, "Is it icy up there?" And the guy that was buying the ticket turned around and said, "Only where they haven't sanded." <laughs> the last personnel story that I'll, that I will tell you, which I think is kind of interesting, when we were. Uh, chasing the Appalachian Long Trail easement piece. Uh, we were up against some pretty tough guys in Washington, and our local council suggested that we needed uh, Washington Council. So off to Washington we went and ended up with an individual who had been in the Reagan White House. Yeah, the Reagan White House. And um, had then migrated to a, a private law firm and seemed to go to all of the proper cocktail parties, which was the way they distinguished themselves in Washington. They had to go to the right place. Um, and actually made a visit here. We were on the top of the mountain looking back toward Killington because to answer that land question that somebody asked here, the Pico land was 2,200 acres at that time which went all the way down on the back of Ram's head 
in a, the west shoulder of, of the Killington area. Uh, but uh, this individual stood on the top of Pico in his three-piece suit, polished wingtips, and said, well, let's walk over to Killington. <laughs> uh, we suggested not the right thing to do. But to truncate the story, um, when 41 was elected, our attorney uh, went to the White House, went back to the White House, left his firm, went back to the White House to help with the transition. Um, and uh, when uh, Senator, I know, when Attorney General Thornburg went back to Pennsylvania to run for the Senate, our attorney, Bill Barr, became the Attorney General of the United States. And I think I've covered pretty much what other folks didn't say. What an amazing 86 years, folks. What an amazing 86 years. So we're here to uh, answer any questions you might have for Frank. I'm going to send him back to the table with his microphone. Um, anyone want to? Does anyone want to know how Frank and Bonnie met? <laughs> Well, um, we were at Castleton together um, and had actually been, she was a year behind me in high school, so we knew each other and started dating uh, when we were at Castleton. Another amusing anecdote, we were pretty much responsible for starting the Castleton Ski Club, which morphed into the Castleton Ski Racing Team uh, back in those days. and. The uh, political race got really uh, heated for the presidency of the Castleton Ski Club. And I got beat. <laughs> Any questions for Frank? Yes. Tom, is, is Charlie's Highway named after Charlie Proctor? Frank? The question uh, is. I don't Richard think was, so. Was, Who's Charlie? Charlie. Could have been, it was probably Chuck Young or Charlie Young, yeah. Yes, question here. So you haven't said, Tom, where the name Pico came from. So we've debated that there is a volcano in Portugal, <laughs> and that's about as far as we got. Um, well, Pico, is, uh, Pico is Spanish for peak. Ergo, we always thought that Pico Peak was a redundant statement. but. <laughs> And that's why we called it Pico Ski Resort and not Pico Peak. So I saw a couple of other hands. So Frank, what is it um, about this place and the culture here that has resulted in such a strong following of Piker skiers? What, what do you think, what do you think this, this is all about? Well, one, we're local. I mean, we're 10 miles from Rubin. Two, the programs have always been uh, locally oriented, whether family season passes and all that stuff. Uh, the junior program existed uh, for many, many years on Sundays. Uh, hundreds of youngsters learned how to ski for literally nickels and dimes. We have always been blessed with what I've considered to be the best staff, the friendliest staff in the world. Uh, so. I believe Rich has the same good people working for him today. Um, and it's the, it's the racing ambiance, it's the, uh, I don't know, it's just a special place. Well, on behalf of this group of Pico loyalists, I want to thank you for uh, what, you, what you and the Belvin family did to create this place that we all cherish so much. Thanks, Tom. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is, I, I think I'm supposed to introduce um, Sheila to provide some clothing, closing, clothing, clothing, we're all getting clothing, <laughs> closing comments, and I do not see her. Where? There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Wow. <laughs> what a, you've been an amazing audience. It's hot, it's close, it's tight. 
and you all hung in. Thank you so much. Give yourself a round of applause. It's great.